بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد First of all, I'd like to, after praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and sending salutation upon his messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I would like to thank the masjid for firstly calling me. As the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he said, لا يشكر الله ما لا يشكر الناس He does not thank Allah, the one who does not thank the people. And also thank you for also attending so that we can benefit and get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says in the Quran, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُ اللَّهِ لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُ اللَّهَ وَالْيَوْمَ الْآخِرَ وَذَكَرَ اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, the very amongst us, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent to us a messenger, which is the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he is uswatun hasana, the best example for us, the best person for us to follow. And who is this example for? Who is this person for? لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُ اللَّهِ For the one who fears Allah, لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُ اللَّهِ The one who uh, hopes in the reward of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala وَذَكَرَ اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا And the one who remembers the last day and the one who remembers Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a lot. And also in a hadith narrated in Bukhari, a Muslim hadith of Anas radiallahu an, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى أكون أحب إليه من ولده ووالده والناس أجمعين. That none of you truly believe and none of you have full complete iman until I become more beloved to you than your children and your parents and all of the people. And in this hadith, the ulama mention a number of issues regarding this hadith. I'll mention the issues then we'll mention the answers. The first question that the ulama ask based upon this hadith that none of you truly believe until I, i.e. the Prophet ﷺ, become more beloved to you than yourselves, your children and the rest of the people. The first question is, what is the ruling of having an ounce of love for the Prophet ﷺ? What is the ruling on having an ounce of love for the Prophet ﷺ? The second question is, what is the ruling on loving the Prophet ﷺ more than everybody else. I'll explain the question shortly. What is the ruling on loving the Prophet ﷺ more than anybody else? And the third question, what is the ruling on loving the Prophet ﷺ due to his uh, character and his mannerisms and everything else regarding him ﷺ? So the first question which is what is the ruling on having an ounce of love, some sort of love that in a heart of a person there is you know, even a speck of love for the Prophet Sallallahu What is the ruling of that? The ulama say the ruling of that is that is considered from the foundations of a person's iman. Meaning if a person does not even have an ounce of love for the Prophet Sallallahu then he is not considered a believer. He is not considered a Muslim. The second question, what is the ruling of lo on, uh, on loving the Prophet Sallallahu more than everybody else? Meaning you love the Prophet ﷺ, so it's a level higher than the first question. You've got the love, you love the Prophet. But the question now is what's the ruling on loving the Prophet ﷺ more than everybody else? And the ulama say that this is from al-iman al-wajib, the obligatory iman. Meaning if a person does not love the Prophet ﷺ more than everybody else, then he's sinning. He's still a Muslim. It's not like the first question that is from the foundations of iman. but if a person does not love the Prophet ﷺ more than everybody else, then he is considered deficient in his Iman. And he can't be considered a complete believer. Such as the hadith, none of you truly believe or none of you have full Iman until you love me more than your children, your parents and the, the, rest, of, uh, the rest of the people. And then the final question is, what is the ruling on loving the Prophet ﷺ due to his characteristics, due to his mannerisms, due to what he went through in his life, just because of you know how the Prophet ﷺ was, not because it's obligatory, not because you have to, but because of how the Prophet ﷺ was 
you gain that natural love for the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and this is what they call an iman al mustahab. This is recommended. This is uh, recommended. But that which is obligatory is to love the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam more than every, anybody else, or everybody else. And these, so these two, uh, this uh, ayah that I mentioned in the beginning, and also the hadith that I mentioned, these are two benefits, or these are two points. The first is. The Prophet وسلم, is our leader and we have to follow him. And the second is that it is obligatory to love the Prophet وسلم, more than everybody else. The issue with these two is that these two are dependent upon another issue. Which is how do we follow the Prophet وسلم, and how do we love the Prophet وسلم, it is dependent upon one issue which is knowing the sunnah of the Prophet How can a person follow the Prophet وسلم, if he doesn't know anything about him? He doesn't know his guidance, he doesn't know his sunnah, he doesn't know what he has uh, legislated. How can he then follow the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam? And the second, uh, the love of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. How can you love a person that you know nothing about? And in reality, the more you learn about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, the more you love the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So these two points are just two benefits of learning about the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And there are many more. Shaykh Abdul Razak al-Badr, hafizahullah, he mentions 10 benefits of studying the seerah. And if anybody wants those benefits, then they can return back to what the Shaykh said. From them is that person through the seerah can understand the Quran because he understands the context of the ayat when they were revealed. From them is that it shows the truthfulness of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. From them is that person learns how to give da'wah and what the Prophet ﷺ focused on, for example, in the first 10 years as we're going to take, the Prophet ﷺ, or th during the Meccan period, he focused on Tawheed and the fiqh he issues only came later in Medina. So that shows the first thing a person calls to is a Tawheed and so on. And there are many other benefits that the Shaykh has mentioned. So today's topic, as you guys know, the title is the Seerah of the Prophet ﷺ. Now the Seerah of the Prophet ﷺ is quite long and I'm sure many teachers have explained it online but you'll find that most of the time these lectures and these series they are very very long sometimes over 50 sometimes even to 100 and sometimes even more so the objective of today's lecture which we're going to split into two parts we'll have a little break five ten minute break in the middle inshallah is that we go through the whole seer of the Prophet Bismillah, we will go through the whole seer of the Prophet ﷺ. However, like I mentioned, some teachers may go through it in a hundred lessons. So we won't be able to mention every single detail. That would be too difficult for us to mention. However, we're going to go through the whole seer of the Prophet ﷺ in a way where we mention the most important points, the most important incidents, the most important battles, and also in a way that you guys, Bismillah, you'll end up memorizing the whole lecture. You'll inshallah memorize the whole lecture because I'm going to test you guys as we go along and some of you that I know I might even put you on the spot <laughs> and if you get a question right then I'll give to you a book as well this book is uh, a, the concise biography of the Prophet وسلم, and his special traits it's by Shaykh Haytham Sarhan a teacher in Mashiach Nabi and student of Ibn Athim uh, and it's been translated in English and it's a very very simple book as you can see very very small and it starts off by talking about the general uh, information about the Prophet وسلم, his guidance, his akhlaq, and then it mentions his actual seerah, uh, and it's only in, it's only about fifty pages, I believe. Yeah, fifty-five pages, and uh, inshallah, in the future, in about a couple of months, I do plan to go through this book as well. But anyways, if you answer the questions, then you'll get a free copy, and if you don't answer the questions and the none left, then you you don't get a copy. But inshallah, I am I am planning to get more copies, uh, hopefully in the next couple of weeks. And when I do. I try to send it to the masjid and if anyone's not got one, they can get one later. But that's, that's not, you know, it's not a promise, maybe you don't. So if you want a copy, then make sure you answer the questions. So, so the seerah of the Prophet the way we're going to split it, is we're going to split it in a very, very easy manner to help you guys uh, memorize and learn the, the seerah. Can you guys see the board from there? If you can't, just move this way a bit so you can see the board better. You can see it, yeah? Okay, so as you can see, the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ, we're going to split it into three main parts. We're going to split it into three main parts. The first is before prophethood. So that includes just before the Prophet ﷺ was born, 
his, his, uh, his birth all the way until he became a prophet at the age of 40 in the mountain of, uh, in the cave of Hira. The second is the Meccan period, which is 13 years as a prophet. The Prophet ﷺ was in Mecca. And then lastly, the third part of this lecture is the uh, Medina period, where the Prophet ﷺ was in Medina for, uh, for 10 years. So this is how we're going to split it. We're going to split the first part regarding before prophethood, the second part uh, in, in Mecca, whilst being a prophet, and lastly in Medina. And then when you get to Mecca and Medina, we're going to go into a bit more detail. We'll get to that. Uh, shortly inshallah now so we start with the first part the first uh, part of the lecture which is before the prophethood before the prophet وسلم, became a prophet and with this we want to talk about firstly the environment that the prophet وسلم, was sent to so the arabs that the prophet وسلم, was sent to what was their state what was the environment like so we're going to talk about it from a number of different um, uh, aspects Firstly, in terms of the social or political aspect, the Arabs, they weren't, there, wasn't one, there wasn't one country or one place that they were all united under. Rather, they were split into different tribes. And it was all the Arab peninsula. There wasn't Saudi or anything like that. That came, you know, that's, that's, that's recent. So at that time, it was the Arabian Peninsula and they were all in different tribes. They all had their own tribes, they had their own leaders and so on. And for that reason, there were a lot of wars between them especially for land, for places that had water, for agriculture, for status and these type of issues, there were a lot of wars between all of these uh, tribes. And they also had certain issues that differentiated them from others, which is they would give preference to men over, over the women. And that was mainly because men were needed in times of war. Men even biologically are more stronger and they are needed more in times of uh, war. So that was one of the main reasons why they would give preference to men over, uh, over women. And as Allah says, وَإِذَا بُشَّرَ أَحَدُهُمْ بِالْأُنْثَىٰ ظَلَّ وَجْهُهُ مُسْوَدَّىٰ That if they were given, given the glad tidings of a, uh, of a daughter, then the flay faces would turn black. They would, they would hate that. That would be a dishonor that if they had a daughter in the house. And... Even though they had some of these you know, qualities which we would consider bad qualities or evil qualities, they did have a number of qualities which are good. For example, taking care of their guests, taking care of their neighbors, fulfilling their promise, promises. So these type of issues, they were really strict and they had good etiquette in there. That's why the Prophet ﷺ, he said, إِنَّمَا بُعِثْتُ لِأُتَمِّمَ مَكَارِمَ الْأَخْلَاقِ Verily, I have been sent to complete good manners because some of the Arabs had some good manners. It wasn't all evil and all bad manners. They had some good manners. So the Prophet ﷺ came to uh, complete. So that which they had which is good, that, that, was, that remained in Islam. And that which is bad, that Islam erased uh, those things. In terms of the economy, then the main ways they made money was through businesses, especially رِحْلَة الشِّتَاءِ والصيف. The journey in the winter and in, and in the summer. In the winter, they would go to uh, Yemen. They would go to Yemen because Yemen is normally a bit hotter. And in um, in the summer, they would go to in the summer they would go to Sham. They would go to Asham because it used to be a bit colder over there. And agriculture was another way. So the farms and everything. Uh, and then uh, arai grazing the the the, the animals, sheep. Uh, goats and stuff like that so they would make a lot of money like that and in terms of the religions then as most of you can probably guess the main what was mainly spread was worshipping idols that's what was mainly spread and as mentioned in Bukhari there's a person called Amr ibn, uh, Amr ibn Luhay Amr ibn Luhay al-Khuzai he was the first one who brought these idols into uh, into Mecca so before him, the, this idol worshipping wasn't a thing in Mecca. This came later on. Amr ibn Luhay al-Khuzai, he brought these idols into Mecca. But with that being said, there were some that were on the religion of Hanifiyyah. Hanifiyyah, i.e. Islam. Not the Islam that we know, that a religion that the Prophet ﷺ came with, but the general meaning, meaning worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone and not committing shirk with him. There were a few people, but they were very, very few. Um, thirdly, there were people who used to worship the sun and the moon and stars. And lastly, there were a few 
Christians and Jews also. The, the Christians were more in places like Yemen and the Jews were more in places like Medina, which is yesterday about the time, and in, uh, in places like Khaybar. We're going to talk about Khaybar uh, later on, inshallah. So as you can see, this is the environment that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi was uh, sent to. And you can see that they had a lot of issues, a lot of wars, and the different religions that were spread. And worshipping Allah alone was very, very uh, little compared to worshipping idols, worshipping the sun, the moon, Christianity. Uh, and Judaism, and most of that was, you know, Christian Judaism, uh, that which has been distorted. But only very, very few people, like Waraqa ibn Nawfal, which we're going to get to shortly as well, he remained upon the original religion of Christianity. So, from this, you can see that there was a need of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to be sent. So, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was born in the year known as the year of the elephant. The Arabs at the time, they never gave numbers or dates to the historical events that took place, rather they will call that year the year of such and such an event. So if the Battle of Badr took place, it was the year of Badr and so on. As for giving it a uh, date, that came uh, later on. So the Prophet ﷺ, he was born in the year of the elephant. And the year of the elephant is mentioned in Surah Al-Fil and Tafsir. If you go to Tafsir Ibn Kathir, it's a long narration, you can read it. It's just like a story. You can read the whole story that takes. Uh, place which I'm going to summarize, which is that a person called Abraha al, al Habashi, he was from Yemen and he wanted everyone to come to him, just like people would go to the Kaaba to uh, worship, uh, to do their tawaf and to do their rituals. He wanted everyone to come to, uh, to come to him. So what he did, he took an army, and in the army there were many elephants, and that's why it's known as Surah Al Fil. Or, or the year of field, the year of the elephants, because his army had a lot of elephants and elephants, especially in those days when there were no you know, guns or anything like that, they were very, very powerful and it's very, very hard to take down an elephant. So he had a very, very strong army and on his way to Mecca, he had destroyed so many other tribes on his way to Mecca. And he also, every time he destroyed a tribe, he would bring them along and make them part of, the, of his army. So then he went and when he reached Mecca, he got to a point where every, tra- every time they tried to move forward, the elephants wouldn't go forward. They wouldn't, w- they wouldn't go forward to attack Mecca. They were on the, on the outskirts of the Mecca, outskirts of Mecca, and every time he tried to go forward, the elephants wouldn't go. And if you, if you would pull the elephants into any other direction, they would go. But in the direction of Mecca, they wouldn't go forward. And then what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he did, he sent uh, a number of, uh, a number of uh, birds, and these birds, had uh, rocks and stones in the in in their hands, and they uh, let go of those from very from very high uh, height, and that obviously came down with force, and that basically destroyed the uh, that basically destroyed the the army of Abraha, and that's how Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. And this was just only a few months before the Prophet Sallallahu was was born. So Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. In Surah Fil, أَنْ تَرَى كَيْفَ عَلَى رَبُّكَ بَأَسْحَابِهِ فِيلَ أَلَمْ يَجْعَلْ كِيدًا فِي تَرْضِيهِ وَأَرْسَلْ عَلِيمٌ طَيْرًا أَبَابِيلٌ تَرْمِيهِمْ بِحِجَارَةٍ مِنْ سِجِّيِّ فَجَعَلَهُمْ كَعْسٍ مَأْكُوفٍ نَصْرُ قَرِيشٍ لِيَلَى فِي قَرِيشٍ إِلَى فِي مَرِحَلَةِ الشِّتَاءِ وَالصِّيفِ فَلْيَعْبُدُوا رَبَّ هَذَا الْبَيْتِ الَّذِي أَطْعَمَهُمْ مِنْ جُوعٍ وَآمَنَهُمْ مِنْ خَوْفٍ ذَوَانَهُ was through this incident. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He kept safe the Kaaba, His house. He protected His house. And that wasn't because of them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had His own army, which was the birds in this instance, who came and they protected the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this happened in the same year that the Prophet was born. And this was like, it was like a sign that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was protecting the Quraysh because something was going to happen. A person was going to be sent, a prophet was going to be sent, and only a few months later, the Prophet ﷺ was born. And when the Prophet ﷺ, uh, was born, his mother, Amina, took the Prophet ﷺ to, uh, to his grandfather, Abdul Muttalib. And Abdul Muttalib took the Prophet ﷺ, and he was in the Kaaba, and there he named the Prophet ﷺ Muhammad. So who is the one who named the Prophet ﷺ Muhammad? It was his grandfather, Abdul uh, Muttalib. And the name of the Prophet ﷺ is a long name, but I'm just going to mention five names of the Prophet, which I want you guys to memorize. So the Prophet ﷺ, his name, which I think everyone should, should know, is Muhammad 
Ibn, Ibn means son of. So if you hear Ibn, the name after it is the person's dad's name. So Muhammad Ibn Abdullah. So his dad's name is Abdullah. Ibn Abdul Muttalib. Uh, his grandfather is called Abdul Muttalib. Ibn Hashim. Hashim is a great grandfather of the Prophet Sallallahu And Ibn Abdi Manaf. Abdi Manaf is a great great grandfather of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So Muhammad Ibn Abdullah Ibn Abdul Muttalib Ibn Hashim Ibn Abdi Manaf. So this is the name of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And there is longer name, but I'm just going to mention these five names uh, for now. And then when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was born, his father passed away before the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was uh, was born. And then what happened? It was a custom of the Arabs at the time that a woman would come from the from the Bedouin women would come and they would take the, the kids or the babies at the time and those babies would live with, a, with that woman for, for two years for the length of uh, breastfeeding which is two years a person may ask that why, would, why was this a culture at that time because there were many benefits of this firstly it would teach them the Fusha Arabic the, the, the formal Arabic without any mistakes because the problem with cities is that in cities a lot of non-Arabs that come for trading and so on so when that happens, you know, the, 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 the language isn't as strong. So if you learn from them, you're going to learn with mistakes. But if they went to the Bedouins, then that's what the Arabic was, the pure Arabic, and they didn't make mistakes. And secondly, because of the air, the air that was there was a lot more cleaner compared to a city. So it would be better for the baby to have uh, that air which is, from, uh, which is from the desert rather than the air which is in the, uh, which is in the city. So this is why the Arabs would send... Uh, their, 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 their babies to live with uh, a Bedouin woman for a couple of years and in, the, in regards to the Prophet وسلم, there was a woman called Halima and she was from the tribe of Banu Sa'd that's why the name given to her is Halima Sa'diya Sa'diya uh, the tribe that she is uh, from and, and by the way I'm pretty sure most of you know, you know these stories it's not something new but the, the objective of, 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 these, of this lecture is if somebody doesn't know the story they learn the story. Somebody does know the story, they, it refreshes their memory and also puts everything into perspective which year, what happened in what order. And thirdly, those who you know, know the story properly so that they can you know, solidify it and memorize it. And like I said, inshallah, most of you will memorize the, the lecture by the end, bismillah. So Halima Sa'adiyah, as you all know, you know, she came and the animal that she came with was very slow. So she was the last one to reach Mecca and all of that. You know, the babies from the more uh, honorable and prestigious families, they were, they were taken. So she was only left with the Prophet ﷺ, so she then took the Prophet ﷺ. But when she took the Prophet ﷺ, she, she saw that there was blessings and barakah in, in her whole life. So the animal that she had, before it was the slowest, it became the fastest. The animals that would bear the least amount of milk, now were producing the most amount of milk. And even in the house, everything she, she saw, everything around her, she saw that there was barakah and there were blessings in there. So because the Prophet ﷺ was with her for two years and it brought so many, so many blessings and barakah to her life, she went back after two years to the Prophet ﷺ's mother and asked that, can the Prophet ﷺ, obviously at that time not a Prophet, but can Muhammad stay with me for a longer period. I've seen so many blessings and at first her mother said no obviously and after a bit she finally agreed. So the Prophet ﷺ then stayed with Halima and at the age of five an incident took place and the incident is known as Haditha-tu uh, al-Sadr the opening of the heart of the Prophet ﷺ. And this is because the Prophet ﷺ's chest was uh, opened uh, twice in his life. The first is now, when he was the age of five, and the second was in the night journey. The second was during the night journey, Al-Isra Al-Mi'raj, which we're going to get to uh, later on, inshallah. So what happened was, the Prophet was playing, he was playing with some of the children, and then a mysterious man came, and in simple terms, floored the Prophet ﷺ, brought him down to the ground. And when the Prophet ﷺ was on the ground, this man went, opened the heart, and clean the heart of the Prophet ﷺ. And this person that came was Jibreel ﷺ. And when he cleaned 
the heart of the Prophet ﷺ, he said that this is a part of shaitan. This is a part of shaitan which he has taken up. And then he uh, placed the chest back as it was. And that's why Anas radiallahu an, he would say later that we would see the effects of that stitching on the chest of the Prophet wasallam. Now obviously when Halima saw this, she saw that this kid, that's not even her kid, has, you know, this has happened to, uh, to him. So she became fearful. And she's now thought that okay, it's been five years, this is more than enough. It's time to give, her, uh, give him back to his mother. So that's when the, uh, Halima gave the Prophet ﷺ back to uh, his mother. So this is at the age of, at the age of five. And then at the age of six, the Prophet ﷺ went with his mother and they went to Yathrib. Yathrib at the time uh, is Medina. By that time it was called Yathrib. And that's because the sisters of his mother, of Amina, so the aunties of the Prophet ﷺ were living in Medina and the Prophet ﷺ and his mother went to meet them just as somebody would go to meet their relatives. But then on the way back, on the way back from, uh, on the way back from uh, Medina, between Mecca and Medina, there was a place known as uh, Abwa, a place known as Abwa, and there the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi mother uh, passed away. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi mother passed away. This is when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was, was six years old. So when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi mother passed away, who's going to look after the Prophet? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi then went to his grandfather, Abdul Muttalib, at the age of six. But then two years later, at the age of eight, his grandfather also passed away. So now he moved to his uncle Abu Talib. And Abu Talib already had like a long, uh, a good relationship with the Prophet ﷺ and he loved, and it was known that he loved the Prophet ﷺ. So that's why he went to uh, Abu, uh, Abu Talib. So this is at the, what, what age? Eight years old. The Prophet ﷺ is now eight years old. And then at eight, the Prophet ﷺ from then onwards stayed with his uncle uh, Abu Talib and in in this period now from 8 to 14 the Prophet did a number of things from them he would help his uncle uh, Abu Talib with uh, with his businesses he the Prophet got married to Khadija radiallahu anha and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam also he became a shepherd uh, the Prophet mentioned that all of the prophets were shepherds because being a shepherd you learn a lot of skills such as being patient looking after being responsible for uh, for your animals and so on and that's how a prophet is a prophet has to look after his nation and he is responsible for the uh, nation and all of these things happened until you know, these are some of the things that happened until the age of 40 there are a few other small instances like the Prophet when he when he was 12 he traveled to uh, Asham and there he met a monk and a monk uh, told his uncle no go back because uh, this is going to spread this this boy is going to become a Prophet and there's other incidences that took place which like I mentioned the objective of this uh, of these lectures is not to go into every detail but just to mention the general seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the most important instances so this is all the way until the age of 40 and then at the age of 40 the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that's when he became a Prophet and with that we finish the first uh, part of this lecture which is before Prophethood so like I said I'm going to test everyone yeah, so now, now, now the time of the test comes. Right, who can tell me firstly a bit about the environment, the Arabs that the Prophet ﷺ was, was sent to? I don't want shouting, all, like a classroom, one put, you know, put your hand up. And who can tell me? Yeah. I did worship. I did worship. A bit more, what else? Yeah, very good. So the Arabs at the time, they were different tribes and they had a lot of wars between them and had a lot of you know, bad traits such as giving precedence to uh, boys over girls. But they did have some good traits, which is uh, you know, uh, fulfilling the oaths, the promises and uh, being good to the guests and the neighbors and so on. So that's good. Plus you can have a book. Right. Um, what about the, in terms of the religions? What different religions are there? Barakallahu. Any more? Uh, 
There are four that I mentioned. Well, let me try to get the full answer. No, that's cheating. That's study. You can't help me. That's cheating. <laughs> Alright, um, what are we? Hanafiya, 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 those who follow Imam Hanifa, right? Uh, Hanafiya, okay. Okay, yeah, good. Last one. Similar to idol worshipping, but not idol worshipping, some other things. The stars, moon, okay, yeah, tafadl. Okay, um, in terms of, uh, last question regarding the Arabs, in terms of, in terms of making money, their businesses, how, what are the different avenues that they would make money? Trading businesses, yeah. He said it. Go on. So that's part. That's part of the businesses. They're traveling, agriculture, which is the farming and stuff like that. Another thing similar to farming. Grazing the uh, the, the the animals, uh, and the animals similar. Them to some of the class. I give it to you. Right, okay. Um, who is the one who, who named the Prophet Muhammad? Abdul Muhammad. Abdul Muhammad. Who was he? He was the grandfather of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What's the name of the Prophet? What's the name? Muhammad. What's the full name that I gave? Muhammad. Abdul Manaf. Mashallah, that's very good. Smash the ear. Okay, um, right, who can summarize what we mentioned after that? Um, this is more for the others now, okay? So who can mention to me what happened in the beginning when person was born? And then in the, in the second year, what happened? Then in the fifth year, what happened? And then in the sixth year, what happened? Then in the eighth year, what happened? <laughs> Go on. No, I don't, I don't want any random, I want in order. Starting from what? Start when he was born. He was born, he was named. After that, what happened? Right, um, he, he was taken on by Halima. Halima Sa'adiya, okay, good. Um, for about two years then, it was time to give him back to his mom. But then he, no, because, no, no. Yeah, no, you're right, you're right, carry on. She gave him back, okay. Him then, back. sixth year, what happened? Makkah, mean, good. Before his uncle. Grandfather. grandfather. When did his grandfather pass away? At the age of eight. At the age of eight. And then he went to? He went to um, After grandfather, uncle. his uncle, who's called? Abu Talib. Who called Abu? Uh, Abu Talib, good. And then, uh, after that, you know, 8 to 40, you mentioned the Prophet had did a number of things, became a shepherd, he, he traveled with his uncle, he got married, and so on. So that's the age of 40. And with that, we finished the first part of the lecture, which is the, the uh, prophethood, or before the Prophet became a prophet. Now, as for, the, as for the prophethood itself, then in this, now this is an over a number of 13 years. So an easier way to m memorize this is we're going to split these 13 years into three parts. The first is the secret call, i.e. the da'wah, the person will give da'wah in secret. Then the next, uh, until, uh, that was until the third year. Then until the tenth year, the person would give da'wah openly, but it was restricted to Makkah. It was restricted to Makkah, uh, those areas. And then after the tenth year, then his da'wah became more public and he started giving da'wah to outside of Makkah. And to, uh, you know, that's, that's how he got in contact with those from Medina and then finally the person did hijrah uh, at the end. So, in terms of, uh, in terms of his uh, prophethood, now like I mentioned, most of these stories, I'm pretty sure most of you know, so I'm just going to summarize some of the stories just uh, due to time. The Prophet Sallallahu uh, Alaihi it's known that he used to go to the cave of Hira. And the, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi even before becoming a prophet, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala protected him from all the different types of fitan, trials and tribulations, 
the Prophet never committed shirk, he never swore by other than Allah, he never drank alcohol, and he would go and isolate himself uh, to ponder about Allah and to ponder about the creation of Allah uh, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And before the Prophet became a Prophet, he, got, he used to get one type of revelation, not the Quran, but slightly different, which is known as truthful dreams. This would happen to the Prophet ﷺ just before he became a Prophet. And that was like preparing the Prophet ﷺ to become a Prophet. And then one, one day when the Prophet ﷺ was in the uh, cave of Hira, the Prophet ﷺ, uh, was there. And we all know the story of Jibreel ﷺ came to the Prophet ﷺ and he told the Prophet ﷺ, he told the Prophet ﷺ, Iqra, read. And the Prophet ﷺ said, I don't know how to read. So Jibreel ﷺ, Hugged, basically hugged and squeezed the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and then again said, "Read." And he said, "I don't know how to read." So he did the same thing again. Read. I don't know how to read. Again did the same thing, and then the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam became frightened. You know, who who's seen an angel, a massive angel? Everybody's looking, see light, light. Prophet doesn't know what's going on, so he he was frightened and he ran back to his family, Khadija radiallahu anha, and that's why he said, "Zamiluni, zamiluni, or dathiruni, dathiruni, cover me, cover me," and the person was shaking. So then Khadija radiallahu anha, that's why she said her famous words as well, uh, comforting the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam that you do so many good deeds, you take after, uh, you look after the poor, you give charity and so on. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never uh, leave you. So then Khadija radiallahu anha took the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa to her uncle, uh, Waraqa ibn Nawfal, who was one of those people who remained upon the true Christianity uh, that we talked about in the beginning. And he is the one that said that this angel that came to you, the same angel that came to uh, Musa alayhi salam. And that you're going to be a prophet and I wish that I was alive to see that day where your own people will uh, take you out of your own, uh, your, your own country, i.e. drive you out of uh, Mecca. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, you know, then realized that he has become a prophet. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down Surah Al-Muddathir, Ya Al-Muddathir, Qum fa'anzir, rise and warn, start, you know, giving da'wah to the people. So the Prophet ﷺ started giving da'wah, but this da'wah was, was secret at the time. Because, uh, for, for obvious reasons, that if he was to give da'wah openly, they would be prosecuted and they would be harmed and so on. But then in the third year, this is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded the Prophet ﷺ to now start giving the open da'wah. Give da'wah openly. Don't, don't you know, do it secretly and now you go into somebody's house. That, that period has finished. So this is where the Prophet ﷺ stood on top of Jabal Safa, you know, if you've been Umrah, after you've done Tawaf, you go and do uh, Sa'i between those two mountains, that one, the first mountain you go to is known as uh, Safa. The Prophet went on that mountain and he stood and that's where he called all of the Quraysh, he called all of them and then he, uh, he, he, he said quite a, f a number of things from them, things he said that if there was an army behind me, behind this mountain, would you believe me? And they said, of course, we've never heard you lie ever. And then the Prophet وسلم, said that I am a warner sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to you. And I am warning you that if you continue with your shirk, then you will be punished in the hellfire. So turn back to Allah, worship him alone, and you will enter uh, paradise. And this is where his uncle Abu Lahab said to him, Tabban laka, where he basically, basically swore or cursed the Prophet وسلم, And that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought down surah to Lahab. Tabbat yada abi lahabin wa tab. That it is not the Prophet وسلم, rather you, you are the one who is uh, cursed. So now this is where the Prophet sallallahu started to give open da'wah and this was in the third year after uh, after prophethood, sorry, after, not after his year, after prophethood. Then in the fifth year, in the fifth year after prophethood, after you know, Islam spreading slightly and uh, the Quraysh, their torturing and prosecution of the Muslims is increasing a lot more. It's increasing a lot more. So some, of, especially some of the weaker Muslims that weren't from, did not have a tribe to support them or did not have money to protect them, the Prophet ﷺ gave them permission to migrate. So in the fifth year after Hijrah, the Prophet ﷺ, he allowed those Muslims to migrate to Abyssinia and at that time there were 11 men and 4 women. 11 men and 4 women who migrated to Abyssinia and from them was Uthman radiallahu an and Uthman's wife Ruqayyah. Who's Ruqayyah? The daughter of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. She was also from those who migrated to Abyssinia because there was a kind Christian king, a uh, just Christian king there. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told them to migrate and go to uh, Abyssinia. So that was in the fourth year, right? 
fifth year. Good, fifth year after uh, Hijrah. Then in the sixth year, in the sixth year, something happened. Something took place that gave a lot of honor to Islam. It gave a lot of strength to Islam. Anyone knows what that is? All right, go on, Musa. You put your hand up, yeah. You don't know what Umar is? No. Okay, mashallah, very good. That's not fair. You, you heard this speech of mine a few weeks ago. So yeah, these two people um, accepted Islam. Umar radiallahu an and Hamza radiallahu an, uncle of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi uh, wa sallam. Oh, I forgot. Must have, you can have a book. Mashallah. So, uh, Hamza radiallahu an, this is where the Prophet وسلم, he was being uh, dishonored and being attacked um, at the Kaaba. So when Hamza radiallahu an, he was out hunting at the time and he heard about this, he came back and then he hit uh, Abu Jahl with his own uh, bow and arrow. And he said, that how, you know, who, how are you cursing him and attacking him when I am upon his religion? I say what he is saying. I, I'm also a Muslim. And when that happened, you know, that's when the, the Quraysh, they were, they, were, they were baffled. They didn't know what to do. Because Hamza radiallahu was a strong person, no one would dare to stand up to Hamza radiallahu an. And even though Hamza, this was, you know, one could say that he accepted Islam out of anger just because, you know, why is he going, why is he attacking my nephew? But they say that after, after Hamza said this, he thought about it and he actually truly did uh, accept Islam. So that is considered uh, when, when Hamza radiallahu an accepted Islam. And Umar radiallahu an also in the same year accepted um, Islam. And this is why Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anh, he says when Umar accepted Islam, then this was fathan lil Muslim. This was like a victory for the Muslims. Another narration, uh, Izza. It was an honor for the Muslims. We weren't able to pray openly at the Kaaba until Umar radiallahu anhu accepted Islam. Before, if they were to pray, then they would be attacked. So most of them want to pray. The person would pray, he would get attacked. And that's why Hamza radiallahu anh, accepted Islam. But when Umar accepted Islam, he said to the Prophet, aren't we upon the truth? If that is the case, then why are we, um, uh, why are we scared? Let's go and pray. So Umar would go out and pray, and because Umar was there and Hamza radiallahu anhu was there, nobody dared, you know, even come close to the, uh, to the Muslims. So this was in which year? The sixth year after after Hijrah, right? After prophethood, good. So this was sixth year. The seventh year, what happened was. Remember those Muslims that migrated to Abyssinia? They heard, they heard something, which is Umar and Hamza accepted Islam. And also there was another incident with the ayat at the end of Surah, to, uh, surah Al-Najm, فَسْجُدِ اللَّهِ وَعَبْدُونَ uh, وَعَبُدُوا That these ayat were revealed, and at the end, فَسْجُدُوا لِلَّهِ Prostrate, do sajda for Allah, uh, وَعَبُدُوا And worship Allah alone. And even the mushrikun, when they heard this, they also did sujood as well. Even though they didn't believe in Allah, but they knew how miraculous and eloquent, you know, they understood the Quran. So when they heard this, they hadn't naturally, they just automatically did sujood to Allah. So this became like a rumor that the Quraysh have accepted Islam. So this rumor reached those Muslims in Abyssinia. So they, so they thought, right, if they accepted Islam, no reason for us to live here, let's go back to our homeland. So they went back to Mecca. But when they came back to Mecca, they found out that this rumor wasn't true. And they were still being prosecuted because they were still, even though Islam was strengthened, still those weaker Muslims, it was still difficult for them. Because Umar and Hamza, they can't be everywhere. So it was still difficult for those Muslims. So then there was a second group of Muslims that migrated back to Abyssinia. So this was the second migration to Abyssinia. And this was 83 men 83 men and 18 women. In total, how many? 83 plus 18? 101. So in total, 101 uh, Muslims, Sahaba, migrated from uh, Mecca and went to uh, Abyssinia. And eventually, mo the majority of these people, once the Prophet migrated to Medina, they also, they also migrated from Abyssinia to, uh, to, uh, to Medina, apart from a few of them who migrated uh, later on. And this is also the famous story of where, you know, when they went, the, the Quraysh sent 
a couple of people after them talk to, talk to the to the king to Najasi that you know these are people that you know they're going to cause corruption they're against your religion also so send them back and then after Jabir recited some ayat from Surah Maryam uh, because Najashi was a uh, just king he kept he said no the Muslims are going to stay take your gifts back and the Muslims are going to stay under my uh, protection so this is in what year this is in the the seventh year now we skip forward we skip three years and we get to the tenth year now we get to the tenth year after prophethood in this year just like the sixth year two people two main people accepted Islam in the tenth year two main protectors of the Prophet وسلم, passed away Abu Talib his uncle who passed away as a non-Muslim who was more of a political support for the Prophet وسلم, because he was on the heads of uh, Quraysh and his wife Khadija radiallahu and her who was more of an emotional support for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam so this year was a very difficult year for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and now because he's lost his support he now needs support from other people so the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam this is where we come to the end of the open call within Makkah and now we start to move outside of Makkah so the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam first goes to uh, Ta'if the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam goes to uh, Ta'if and tries to get support from them but they rejected the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and as you know famously, famously is narrated that day the kids would stone the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so that he was bleeding from his feet and that his sandals would stick you know because the blood it would stick to his feet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and then at time of Hajj at time of Hajj all of the different Arabs from different places and different places they would all come to the Hajj so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam found this as an opportunity to give da'wah to people outside of Mecca. So in the 11th year, there were six people from Yathrib. Where's Yathrib? Medina, the old name of Medina. We don't call it Yathrib anymore, it's, we call it Medina now. But at that time it was, it was called uh, Yathrib. So six people came and the Prophet ﷺ gave them da'wah and they accepted Islam. This was in the 11th year. They went back. The following year, the 12th year, they came back. And now it went from six to 12, it doubled. So in the 12th year, 12 people came from um, came from Medina and they took a pledge of allegiance to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to not uh, to worship Allah alone, not to commit shirk with him and to um, and to uh, forbid evil and to command the good. And with this, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sent Musa'ab ibn Umair radiallahu an and Amr ibn Umm al-Maktoum with these people from Yathrib as teachers to go and teach the people of Medina regarding Islam. So this is in the 12th year. Then in the 13th year, the last year when Prophet was in Mecca, these people again came, but now from 11th year was 6, 12th year was 12. Now in the 13th year, there were 73 men and two women. So in total 75. 75 people came from Medina who had accepted Islam and they all pledged allegiance to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And now the the prosecution and the torturing of the Muslims was getting too much. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He commanded and gave permission to the Prophet sallallahu wasallam to now migrate from Mecca to, uh, to al Medina, To Mecca, uh, from Mecca to al Medina, because Mecca, al Medina is now ready. There were 75 people who came last, uh, who came just uh, during that year. And now the Prophet sallallahu wasallam is going to migrate to a city which is ready for him. And with this, we come to the conclusion of the Meccan period. And we're going to take a little break. Before the break, I'm you know, quickly going to revise. And then after the break, we'll start with the Hijrah and continue with the uh, Medinan uh, period. So let's just quickly recap the uh, Meccan period. So, Meccan period. How, how many years did the Prophet ﷺ do his silent da'wah? Somebody is not... Go on. It's on the board. Three years. Okay, for, for three years, right. And then after the third year, there was open da'wah. In which year was the first migration to Abyssinia? And in which year was the second migration to Abyssinia? One person. Three and six, no. Fifth and seventh. There you go, Salimah. Okay, that was the fifth and seventh, right? What about in between in the sixth year? Something happened. Open in the sixth year. Mm. 
he told you, but it's fine. Hamza and Umar radiallahu an both accepted Islam and gave victory uh, and a lot of strength to Islam. By the way, uh, sisters, don't feel left out. I, I've given uh, a few copies on the sister side. So at the end, uh, I think one of the sisters will do a uh, little quiz for you guys and you can have a few copies as well. Okay. Right, that was the, so we've done fifth, sixth, and seventh. Right. In which year did the Prophet uh, Prophet's wife and uncle pass away? Uh, one person, I'm going to give a gift, a gift. Right, Arshad, I heard your voice. Go, yeah. one of you, one of you. Okay, right. Um, and then in the 11th year, how many people came from Yathrib? No, one person, one person. In the first, no, in 11th year, not in the 13th, 11th. Sorry? No. Six people. And the year after that? And the year after that? 75. If you're already answering, you take a copy then. Just let me know. I don't want you guys just piling up copies for no reason. Okay, and then uh, finally, in which year did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam migrate? 13th. Who said that? Oh, my Faisal. Okay, now one person, one person to summarize the whole Makkan period. Who's brave enough? One person to summarize the whole Makkan period. No one. Right, what I'll do, we'll take the break, and the first question I'll start off with is, is this question, inshallah. Okay, so we'll take a little break. We'll uh, start again at, at 10 past, inshallah. At 10 past, we'll, we'll start again. <laughs>